Good afternoon, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here, whether you're joining us in person or joining us on our YouTube station. We're all looking forward to hearing from Colin Calloway about his new book, The Indian World of George Washington. But before you hear from our speaker, I'd like to tell you about two pro other programs coming up soon here. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, the Richard Nixon Foundation presents a Nixon Legacy Forum on No Final Victories, Lessons from President Nixon's Drug Abuse Initiatives. A panel of officials from the Nixon years will discuss the administration's response to the growing drug abuse problem in the 1960s and early 1970s. And I'm sure they're going to touch on Elvis's visit to the White House. On Tuesday, May 8th at 7 p.m., former White House photographer Pete Souza will present an illustrated lecture using images from his recent book, Obama, An Inti Intimate Portrait. Signed copies of the book will be available for purchase. To learn more about these all, uh, to learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events at archives.gov. Check out our website or sign up at the table outside to receive email updates, and you will also find information about other National Archives programs and activities. Another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The Foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities, and there are applications for membership out in the lobby also. The Indian World of George Washington, as Professor Callaway states in his book's introduction, shows how Native America shaped the life of the man who shaped the nation. We know a great deal about George Washington, or think we do. In school, we learned that he was our first president and commander of the American army that won the Revolutionary War, but we sometimes see the, these two roles in isolation from the world Washington inhabited. In this world, territorial expansion was key to prosperity and growth. Washington, from his youthful days as a surveyor, during his military career and on through his presidency, looked to the West for opportunities and encountered peoples who already inhabited those lands. In the National Archives, we hold 377 ratified Indian treaties, three of them from Washington's presidency. Across the Mall, the National Museum of the American Indian has featured one of these treaties in its nation-to-nation -nation exhibit for six months at a time. Through this partnership, millions of visitors over the last few years have been able to view these important documents. But as I said, there are more than 300 treaties. To open up access to all of these treaties, we are embarking on a new project to digitize all of them, plus their supporting documents. Future scholars, as well as tribal leaders and lawyers, will be able to examine them closely, not only for historical importance, but also for their relevance today. This project will open up our vaults to a worldwide audience much as the digitization of the papers of the nation's founding fathers has made accessible the words written by George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and others. Founders Online is a wonderful portal to these papers gathered and annotated by dedicated teams of scholars, as Professor Calloway referred to the staff of the papers of George Washington in his acknowledgments. All of the separate papers projects represented in Founders Online have been, in support, have been supported by the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, the grant-making arm of the National Archives. Providing access to our records is our core mission. Because we preserve and make available these records, writers can put together the pieces of historical evidence to tell us stories of our past. Colin Calloway is John Kimball, Jr., 1943 Professor of History and Professor of Native American Studies at Dartmouth College. He first arrived at Dartmouth as a visiting professor in 1990 and became a permanent member of the faculty in 1995. He received his PhD from the History of Leeds in England in 1978. After moving to the United States, he taught high school in Springfield, Vermont, served two years as associate director and editor of the Darcy McNichol Center for the History of American Indian at the Newbury Library in Chicago, and taught for seven years at the University of Wyoming. Professor Calloway has written many books on Native American history, including The Scratch of a Pen, 1763 and the Transformation of North America, One Vast Winter Count, The Native American West Before Lewis and Clark, and two books for the Bedford series in History and Culture, 1870-1880, 
Our hearts fell to the ground, Plains Indian views of how the West was lost, and the world turned upside down. Indian voices from early America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Colin Calloway. Thank you, David. Thank you all <coughs> for giving up your lunchtime coming, although I'm not sure why you would on a day like this. Where I live in Vermont two weeks ago, we still had snow on the ground. So if it wasn't for the fact that I was showing you images, I'd suggest we have class outside. I also should say I have a smart blue blazer if anyone feels uncomfortable, but if you don't, I'm much more comfortable without it. Um, so the publisher has billed my book as a, as a biography, which took me somewhat by surprise, because I never thought of it as that, even though it, it follows <coughs> Washington's life as, as its narrative arc. My thinking behind this, this book was to basically use George Washington as a vehicle, if that doesn't seem, sound sort of too crass. Um, because as probably a European, uh, when I look at, at American history, so much of American history makes no sense to me without the presence of Indian people. As a historian, so often reading American history, so much of it made no sense because there were no Indian people in that story. And a lot of us have been doing that kind of work. So the thinking here was to take perhaps the most famous American at the most uh, critical point in the nation's uh, creation <clears throat> and to demonstrate how important Native Americans were in that, or perhaps another way, to get lots and lots of people who read lots and lots of books about George Washington to read this book and find that they were actually reading about Native Americans. Uh, but perhaps not Native Americans as, as, uh, as such, so much as about their importance and why they mattered uh, in, in this story. And fundamental to that, of course, is an understanding that <clears throat> this is a country, this is a nation built on Indian land. Now, that's not a revisionist interpretation of American history. That's really just a fact. And it's not even my idea. I stole that idea from George Washington. He understood that. He said that quite clearly, or almost quite clearly. When I first uh, was contemplating writing this book, I read lots of biographies of George Washington, um, most of which made minimal mention of Native Americans, but all of which talked at great length about Western land if you simply cross out Western and put Indian. That's a whole different uh, complexion on the thing. So this is a map from the <coughs> Library of Congress, uh, basically showing George Washington's lands. And by the time he dies, he has about 45,000 acres of land. He's a famous or infamous speculator at a time when most, <coughs> certainly men of wealth and elite status, were speculators. He recognized and identified Western slash Indian land as the key to his personal fortune. And when he became president, he recognized it as a key to the future prosperity and power <coughs> of the United States. And he made no qualms about that. But it's also a study not only about Indian land or the importance of Indian land, but about Indian power. I think if we stop and think for a moment, we can say, yeah, this is a country built on Indian land. <clears throat> it used to be Native American, now most of it is not. But I think it's perhaps more difficult for us to think back to a time when the nation and the future, if you like, the destiny of the nation <clears throat> could be affected by Indian power, right? Because we're so accustomed to knowing how the story ends and to look back at a time when this nation, this young republic, was still precarious and Indian power still mattered and in some cases still actually threatened that nation is perhaps a little more difficult to get. So in Washington's <coughs> administration, particularly his first administration as, chair, as president, Indian delegations to Philadelphia were a common occurrence. On one occasion, I think it's November of 1796, according to 
<coughs> John Adams' diary, the President Washington had dinner on four different occasions with four different groups, delegations of Indians to Philadelphia in one week. And it was not uncommon for Washington to, to do that. It was not uncommon for there to be delegates on the streets of Philadelphia. In fact, in one occasion, a group of Northern Indians and a group of Cherokees, Chickasaws, Choctaws visiting the capital at the same time bumped into each other in Peel's museum and it took some pretty nimble diplomatic uh, footwork to, to sort that out. The reason they were there was not only, and not actually always, <coughs> to see land. In fact, on a number of occasions, Washington said to, his, to Henry Knox and to interpreters, whatever you do, don't mention land. Right? Now, of course, it was all about land, but Washington also recognized the importance of having the allegiance and the friendship of Indian people in this precarious period of its existence. So part of what I'm doing in this book, and I'm able to do in the book because of that great work that's been done by teams of, uh, of scholars in, in gathering the Founding Fathers and Washington's correspondence, is to recapture that time. Because I think we as a society, and most of us histor historians, have forgotten what Washington knew, that <coughs> Indians mattered, that Native Americans were almost omnipresent, and that the power that they wielded continued to shape uh, how things unfolded. So Washington <coughs> is someone who, in his own lifetime and since, has been identified with the West, perhaps more than anyone else. This is, as far as I know, this is the earliest portrait that we have of Washington, done when he's approaching middle age, but he chooses to dress for it in the <coughs> attire of a colonial officer, recalling his time and his service during the Seven Years' War, or the so-called French and Indian War. Right? You can't have a French and Indian War without Indians, right? So, to go to my point. <coughs> but this recalled his time on the frontier, on the West, which was clearly a, uh, a molding experience uh, for him. And he was on the forefront of Virginian expansion, which was on the forefront of colonial and national expansion. He cut his teeth as a surveyor, um, earned his first land that way, his first real money that way, but he also continued from that point onwards to look at land with a surveyor's eye. If you look at this map, which is a British map from the middle of the 18th century, you can see why Virginia might be taking the lead. Virginia is that large pink bit in the middle. And its colonial charter granted it rights to land well as far as the Western Sea. But of course, it also laid claim to <coughs> what is now the Ohio Valley and the Ohio country. And that was key to uh, determining the outcome of the struggle for the continent and the struggle for the West. And as a Virginian, as a speculator, as a surveyor, Washington was deeply interested in that area. But he and they weren't the only people interested in that area. Of course, Pennsylvania had claims that area, was interested in the area. The French claimed that area. The French Empire stretching from <coughs> the St. Lawrence to the Gulf of Mexico looks huge right, on this map, but it's actually a house of cards. It's minimal in terms of manpower, garrisons, that kind of thing. It rests for its, it depends for its existence and survival upon Indian alliances. Right? French posts in the West survive only because of the Indian people who are around it. They don't survive because of power. And of course, this is a map that uh, neatly divides up the continent between three contesting European powers. And it's also a total fantasy, right? because there are dozens, if not hundreds, of nations whose names are not on that map. Because the Ohio country, or the area which the French and the British are contesting, is also occupied and contested by multiple Indian nations. 
people who've lived there from time immemorial, people like the Shawnees who've been uh, originated there, moved away and relocated, people like the Delawares who've <clears throat> moved into that area to escape European expansion from the east, people like the Miamis who've been drawn into that area to <coughs> uh, access European trade from the east, Iroquois people who've migrated into that area, and Iroquois and individuals who are established in their, that area to look out for the uh, interests of the Iroquois League. So when Washington and Virginia push west into that area, they are not going into empty land. It's not land that's there for the taking. In many ways, they're entering something of a hornet's nest and a very volatile situation. And Washington's first mission into that area is as a messenger sent by Governor Dinwiddie of Virginia to go to the forks of the Ohio and beyond and the forks of the Ohio are crucial. It's the location, of course, of present-day Pittsburgh, <clears throat> where the colonial powers were competing to get there first. The French in the 1750s were stepping up the ante. They were sending troops into the Ohio country. They were building outposts. And seeing Virginia's interests and the empire's interests threatened, then when he sends Washington, basically with a request to the French, wouldn't you mind awfully leaving? And of course, the French response was thanks, but no thanks. But it was also something of an information gathering trip in which Washington is getting a sense of what's going on out there and bringing back information, <coughs> draws this map, and under Vil uh, Dinwiddie's instructions, writes a journal of his experiences, literally overnight, which goes immediately into print and is used to drum up support both in Virginia and in Britain for countering that French threat. This French threat is real. We need to uh, deal with it. And so <clears throat> almost immediately the following year, Washington is sent back into the Ohio country as, a, as an officer in the Virginia militia with instructions to contact and <clears throat> uh, cooperate with someone he'd met the previous year, a Seneca chief by the name of Tenarison. This is not Tenarison, but this is a, 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 a painting by a contemporary artist, Robert Griffin, that I think captures the, 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 the kind of people that Washington was meeting and rubbing shoulders with. Tenarison was also called the Half King, and that was a title, not his name. The Half King was perhaps an ambassador, appointed by Onondaga, which was the central council fire of the League of the Six Nations, Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, Senecas, Tuscaroras, to look out for their interests in the Ohio country, where the Iroquois League claimed dominance. So Tenarison as a half-king was a representative of the Iroquois League, but he also, because of that position, to some extent represented the Ohio nations in their dealings with the Iroquois. And that, as you might imagine, like a medieval martial lord, was a position which could be developed into substantial influence, which Tenarison did. When the French invaded, he went to the French fort and gave them a good telling off and said, get out. If you don't, I and the Ohio nations will see to you, will we'll take care of it. What Tenarison wanted was not French garrisons. He wanted English trade. He could tolerate French trade, but not garrisons. Unfortunately, he was, there was a fair amount of bluff and bluster there, and not all the Ohio nations shared that commitment to <coughs> resistance, open resistance against the French, because after all, it was their villages that were likely to be burned if war broke out. And so when Washington comes, he depends heavily on Tenarison, right? a seasoned warrior, probably by this time his late 40s or 50s, a diplomat, somebody who knows Indian country, knows how things work. Washington's <coughs> 21, right? doesn't know how anything works. Right? And m many of his biographers, particularly the later ex uh, 
generation will talk about the events in this period and say how <clears throat> in this time Washington displayed those unmistakable traits of leadership which were going to mark him for future greatness. I've read through this stuff time and time again and I can't see any trace of that. <laughs> I see a, a young man out of his depth in Indian country maneuvered by somebody who was a master of Indian country, Tanarison. <clears throat> There's French activity in the area. Tanarison and Washington are sending each me other messages, each one boasting of how much power they have, where they actually have very little power. Washington and a group of Virginia militia, Tanarison and a group of Indians, <clears throat> go to intercept a party of Frenchmen. The only person who been telling Washington that this party of Frenchmen is coming to attack him is Tanarison. Right? It seems that the party of Frenchmen led by Anson and Saint Jumonville was actually doing what Washington had done the year before, coming with a summons to the Virginians to leave territory that belonged to the King of France. Right? But Washington and Tanarison go to attack, attack them. Washington convinced that they're coming to attack him. Right? Here's the source of that. When that skirmish takes place, Washington's account of it is very brief, and that's very unlike Washington when he's talking about himself in battle. And what seems to have happened is that the Virginians open fire, the French break and run, and they fall to the tomahawks of, of the Indians. And Tanarison <coughs> uh, comes up to the wounded uh, Jumonville, who seems to be attempting to read his summons in French, Tanarison speaks French, Washington doesn't, and sinks a tomahawk in his head and says, thou art not dead yet, my father. Which is both a grisly act and a very calculated ritual act. There's more to it which is quite grisly, but I won't go into it right now. <clears throat> what he's actually doing is symbolically and graphically throwing off the French alliance, killing the alliance with his father, who's not the young ensign, but the French governor in Quebec. He then sends war belts and tomahawks to other tribes to bring them into this war that he has caused. This is the opening shot of the <coughs> Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War, which we now sometimes call the war that made America because it led to the American Revolution. Washington did not cause that. This guy did. Washington, in many ways, was his, uh, his instrument in doing that. Washington subsequently has to surrender, in a quite humiliating fashion, to a French force that comes to uh, retaliate for that. Not only has to surrender, but he signs surrender documents where, unknowingly, doesn't read French, he admits to murdering, assassinating the French ensign. That debacle leads the British to send to North America the biggest army it's ever sent, led by Edward, uh, General Edward Braddock in 1755, with the objective of capturing the forts of the Ohio, destroying the French fort, Fort Duquesne, that has been built there. Braddock almost does it. Washington accompanies him, gets within reach of the fort, and then his army is not only defeated, but essentially demolished and routed by a group of Frenchmen and Indians. It's a multinational Indian coalition that brings its firepower to bear on the British. It's actually more of a collision than a planned ambush. But when it happens, both armies do what they're trained best to do. The Indians go to the trees, fire from cover, lay down a barrage of deadly fire, the redcoats fight in ranks right, and find themselves in a killing field. Braddock is killed. One of the few officers not even wounded is George Washington. Has horses shot from under him, bullets through his coat, and it uh, led, leads to his growing reputation as a, in the West. Shows undoubted courage in this. But it also demonstrates the limits of empire in Indian country, this most powerful British empire army that had managed to blaze a trail across the Appalachians right to the, almost the gates of the fort, is swept aside by Indian power <coughs> in alliance with the French. 
So the British realized, and particularly uh, Braddock's replacement, General John Forbes, that if they're going to succeed in Indian country, they need to recognize <coughs> and work according to what Indians want. And what Indians want is not <coughs> to be subservient to the French or the British. They want their homelands to be kept independent. They want trade, but they don't want garrisons. And so Forbes recognized is that unless he can wean Indian allies from the French, any further attacks on Fort Duquesne are going to meet with the same fate as Braddock. So he dispatches emissaries and diplomats into Indian country while he is advancing toward Fort Duquesne. Washington is on that expedition too. And he's not very helpful. He complains about the fact that Forbes is building a road in the wrong place because he's building a road that <coughs> leads from Pennsylvania. Washington, as a Virginian, wants this to go from Virginia. He complains about the sl slow process. He's insubordinate. Forbes encounters his letters and says his behavior is kind of unbecoming coming an officer. Part of the slowness is because Forbes is taking the time that it takes to do business in Indian country. You know, the Treaty of Easton in 1758, 500 Indians from a dozen different nations assemble. The British promise them that when the war's over, their lands will be safe. For the most of the Indians, that's what they've been fighting in the war for. So they say, OK, mission accomplished. They withdraw from the war. And without them, Fort Duquesne is de de doomed. Okay? There's no way the French can defend that territory without Indians. Forbes' army advances, has a green light to advance, unhindered by Indians. The French blow up the fort <coughs> and evacuate. Basically, for Washington, that's the end of the Seven Years' War. Indians have started it. Indians have effectively ended it in that area of the world. At the end of that war, however, the British immediately forget the pro promises they've made from the Indians. They put red-coated garrisons into the forts, and they cut back on giving gifts to Indians, which is a huge mistake because gifts are essential lubricants of diplomacy. They show friends and allies to be serious and committed. At the same time that the Brits are sending garrisons into Indian country, they cut back on gifts. It's a twin demonstration of hostility. And in 1763, a dozen years before American colonists do it, Indians in the Ohio country and the Great Lakes revolt against the British Empire. And they almost succeed. It rocks the British Empire back on its knees, and Britain responds in a couple of ways. It decides it has to leave an army in North America. And that costs a lot of money. And Britain is faced with <coughs> administering this huge new empire that is, that is one. So some bright spark says, well, let's tax the American colonists. Right? And we all know where that went. Right? The other piece of it we don't know so well, and it's this. In October 1763, the British government says, we've got to do something to prevent recurrent violence and bloodshed on the frontier. As long as people trespass onto Indian land, we're going to have this happening time again. And the Royal Proclamation of 1763 basically establishes the Appalachian Mountains as a barrier between <coughs> British territory and Indian territory. Now, Britain claims everything, right? The end of the Seven Years' War, France basically abandons its holdings on, or its claims on North America to Britain, east of the Mississippi. But west of the Appalachians, is going to be a, an Indian reserve. British settlement will be east of the Appalachians. Nobody goes west without permission. No traders go west without a license. And no sales of Indian land take place unless they're done by the agents of the Crown in open and formal council with Indian delegations. That's a huge blow to people like not the settlers who are living on the frontier, many of whom are Scots-Irish who've never paid any attention to British 
government when they were 3,000 miles the other side of the Atlantic. They're not about to start doing it now. They continue to squat on Indian land. The people it hurts are people like George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, the Lee family, elites who've been speculating and investing in Western land for years, waiting for this day, right? hoping that when the French were defeated, the floodgates would be opened, British settlers would swarm across the mountains and be looking for land to buy and rent, and they would have land to sell them. Now, only the crown can buy and sell land west of the Appalachians. Washington is apoplectic. Right? This is the moment where they, many of these guys seriously begin to think we would be better off out of the empire. The empire that only a few years before they were fighting to serve. And from these events, there's a straight line to the American Revolution. And I want to look at a piece of the revolution we don't often look at. Right? The revolution's a war for independence, of course. But it's also a war about Indian land and who has access to it. And that adds a different dimension to it. So if anyone here from the NMAI will recognize this. For Oneida people, they may remember that they had an important role in the American Revolution. Right? This is Polly Cooper, Shenandoah, who took corn to Washington's troops at Valley Forge. Right? But we don't acknowledge a Native American role or a Native American importance in the Revolution. I was just in the rotunda before I talk, and there's a little panel display on women in the Revolution and slavery in the American Revolution, but not on Indians in the Revolution. And so in the rotunda, I suspect, what we know about Indians in the Revolution is what Thomas Jefferson tells us in the Declaration of Independence. That is that the king unleashed, unleashed savage warriors on the frontiers who committed mayhem, killing innocent women and children. It's a sacred text, obviously, so it must be right, but it's actually not. Um, the first Native people to pick sides or fight in the Revolution I think were from Stockbridge, Massachusetts. They were Christian Indians and they volunteered to fight for the Americans. Caused Washington a problem. They turned up serving his army in Boston and he didn't quite know what to do with them. Wrote back to Congress, but well, can I do this? Uh, and that was an issue for a while. Famous painting, Washington crossing the Delaware. Right? Not so famous, the day before Christmas Eve, when presumably had a lot on his mind, right, planning this, he wrote two letters to Indians in, in Maine and Nova Scotia, reminding them of how important their alliance was to the United States. And one of the points I make in the book is that a lot of the things we think remember about Washington and the Revolution are to do with the East, right? He's crossing the Delaware, going east to, to beat up on the Hessians, right? But Washington is always and also facing West because he knows that independence is one thing. Independence without land is not much. That in order to <clears throat> secure a future and prosperity for the nation, there needs to be room for the nation to grow. If you secure independence and you're hemmed east of the Appalachians, as Britain had indicated should be the case, then the young nation would be stifled. So when Washington launches expeditions into Indian country, this is the Mohawk War Chief Joseph Brandt, who sided with the British, as most Indians did, right? because the British at least had some record of trying to protect Indian land, whereas the Americans always seemed to be hell-bent on grabbing Indian land. When Washington dispatches <coughs> expeditions into Indian country, they are not only to stop Indian raids on American frontiers. They are also to lay claim to those lands. The, uh, the Sullivan expedition into Iroquois country, named after General Jim, uh, John Sullivan of, of New Hampshire, was actually Washington's expedition. It was his idea, Washington, the French and Indian War had said, the only way to stop Indian raids is to stop them at source send troops into Indian country, destroy their villages, destroy their cornfields, and that way you will stamp out raids. You can't 
you don't have a chance of trying to contain them when Indian warriors are coming to, to your backyard. Sullivan's expedition carried fire and sword through Iroquois country, burned 40 villages, destroyed 160,000 bushels of corn, cut down orchards, but also opened the eyes of its officers to the fertility and the wealth of that country. This was a veritable cornucopia, which meant that those people who were on it and those people who read the journals of those who were on it were in the starting blocks ready to go into upstate New York, Finger Lakes District, and that fertile territory as soon as the revolution was over. Likewise, expeditions into the Ohio country. The war in the West, which is a war against Indians and a war of independence by Indians, continues long after the war of independence ends in the East at Yorktown. And so some of the bloodiest conflicts and Indian victories happen in 1782. Well, then, unfortunately, the British and the Americans make peace in Paris, and there are no Indians at the Peace of Paris. The British inform the Indians that they've made peace and that they have transferred to the United States <coughs> all land south of the Great Lakes, east of the Mississippi, north of Florida. This is Indian land. As in 1763, so in 1783 at the Peace of Paris, Indian land is transferred from one power to another without Indian agreement, approval, or presence. And this is what Washington had hoped for, but it's also crucial to the young republic, because right? it's actually all that it has. Right? In 1763, at the end of the Seven Years' War, Britain was bankrupt. In 1783, at the end of the War of the Revolution, the United States is bankrupt. Has no money, has really nothing except land. And its future as a nation depends upon being able to transfer that land, which is still Indian homeland, into American real estate. And that involves getting the individual states to cede its land, their land to the federal government. But it also entails taking that land from Indians. And the United States tries various ploys by saying to the Indians, we beat the British, you were allied with the British, you lost, we're going to take your land. That didn't last very long, it caused a lot of disruption in Indian country. <clears throat> but Indian uh, people sort of smartened up and did what the Americans were doing, formed a confederation to resist the American confederation that was trying to take their land. In 1787, Congress <coughs> issues the Northwest Ordinance, referring to Northwest Territory. And it does two things in there, which um, are fundamental, I think, to understanding US Indian policy at this point and for a long time forward. One is, we're not going to establish colonies, because if we have established colonies like we were colonies, those colonies will do what we did. They'll grow up, get strong, and say, we don't need to be governed from thousands of miles away. We'll create our own nation. Right? So Wisconsin could have been its own nation. We didn't want to have that happen. What they said was, American territories will not be a permanent second-class status. American territories will be a phase. And once enough people inhabit those territories, they will then petition to join the United States on an equal footing with other states. And this is how most states in the nation come into the United States. It's a blueprint for nation building and expansion. And of course, it's a blueprint for nation building and expansion across Indian land. Paradoxically, it seems, in that same ordinance, the United States pledges itself to deal honorably with Indian people and never to invade their lands except in just and lawful wars authorized by Congress. There's a phrase to conjure with. Right? <coughs> when Washington becomes president and the Constitution is passed, you get a more perfect union, but you now have an opportunity to create Indian policy for the new nation. The Constitution grants 
authority to Congress and the President. The President, in company with his Secretary of War, Henry Knox, okay, Indian Affairs is lodged in the Secretary in the Department of War, which maybe gives you some idea of the thinking there, rather than in the Department of State, which where it is still not. Right? It's in the Department of the Interior with resources, I guess. But maybe counterintuitively, Henry Knox, like Washington, is a man, I think, committed to trying to do the right thing for Indian people right? to the extent that they can. Washington and Knox are committed to expansion, taking Indian land. That's, a, that's never a question. That's a given. Without that, there is no United States. However, within those constraints, we must, should deal as honorably, fairly, and justly with Indian people as we can. How can we do that? Well, the best way to do it is revert to the British model of making treaties with Indians. Right? I mean, to put it simply, we want your land. You're going to give us your land. There's no question about that. We will pay you a fair price for that land. And that will be an agreement that everybody can, can adhere to. Right? That's plan A. That's great if that works. And there's all kinds of ways in which Indian treaties can be manipulated, distorted, etc., etc. <clears throat> but what's plan B if Indians say thanks but no thanks? And that's another issue. So this is, uh, this is not a sketch of Alexander McGill, a very famous Creek chief. It's a sketch of a guy by Apotlemico. It's the first treaty that the United States signs, signs with anybody, signs with an Indian nation after the Constitution Treaty of New York, held in New York, right? attempts to make peace with the Creeks in the southeast have not worked. Washington invites a delegation of Creeks and Alexander McGillivray to come to New York. <clears throat> Why? Well, one reason is Washington does not want to get pulled into a war between the Creeks and the state of Georgia because the Creeks have <clears throat> strong relations with Spain who would love this to explode into a war. But there's also the tricky problem that the Creeks can <clears throat> have a total of maybe 5,000 warriors and the American army at the time constitutes about 500 men. This is not a war you can afford to have. Washington invites <coughs> Creeks to New York. They're treated like a, it's like a state visit, right? Put Mark on's visit to shame. All the way along, these people were feted and <coughs> treated with respect, and then a treaty was made. Right? It's an interesting treaty because there's not only the treaty, but there are secret articles to the treaty, which were made really only with Alexander McGillivray. So there's a, it, it, that's a story in itself. But what happens when Indian people say, no, <clears throat> we don't want to sell you our land. This is our land. This is what we fought for. Then plan B is to, and I use Washington's word here, extirpate them. You look up the definition of that, it means to pull up by the roots or to wipe out completely. Right? This is not, it's not talking about genocide for all Indian people, but specific groups who resist and prove recalcitrant and who refuse the hand of peace <coughs> have to be dealt with severely. So you send American power, <coughs> American armies into Indian country to do that. 1791, Washington dispatches Arthur St. Clair into the Ohio country, to march to northwest Ohio, destroy the center of Indian resistance, establish a fort there, establish American dominance there. <clears throat> and what happens to Arthur St. Clair is the same thing that happens to Edward Braddock in 1755. His army is completely destroyed. It's the only army that the United States has. November 4, 1791, it's, it's obliterated. When the muse reaches Philadelphia, Thomas Jefferson said, nobody's talking about anything else. Here was this young republic hemmed in by Indian nations with Britain and Canada, Spain in the southwest, in southwest, just waiting for it to fail, and it has no army. This Indian victory <clears throat> generates questions of court-martial. It generates the first congressional investigation. 
it generates the first <coughs> uh, location of executive uh, privilege because critics of Washington and uh, members of Congress want to follow the money and they're convinced that the money and the corruption go all the way to Alexander Hamilton. And so they demand documents. And Washington, as first president and conscious of precedent, huddles with his cabinet and says, what do we do? And the cabinet says, well, we have to deliver over the documents, but the president should be able to withhold documents if he feels that delivering them will be detrimental to the public interest. It wasn't called executive privilege then. It was in the 1970s, but that, that's where it comes from. It also generates a huge shift in how the United States thinks about, raises, and funds its army. Raising militia, raising short-term troops, those kinds of things, totally inadequate to dealing with Indian power. Within three years, a new American army has been raised at a cost of a million dollars, been reorganized into a much more efficient and effective fighting machine, and has <clears throat> gone into Indian country and reversed the outcome of St. Clair's defeat. This individual is a, a Miami chief by the name of Little Turtle, often credited with masterminding <coughs> Sinclair's defeat. After that, he adjusts and decides that the best way for his people is to um, try and follow the white man's path. And that's <coughs> something that Washington's interested in. So back to these Indian delegations in Philadelphia. A lot of them are coming in the wake of the destruction of the American army because Washington and his administration are having to hustle. They want to keep the Iroquois out of the Western Confederacy. They've got to buy time so that they can rebuild their army, etc., etc. But there's another component to their policy. <clears throat> and it's a component of it's what is at least in Washington and Knox's term, called civilization. That you can buy Indian land, you can take Indian land by conquest, but you can actually also get Indian land by civilizing people out of their land. If Indian people are hunters, they need a huge amount of territory. If you can convince them and convert them into becoming farmers and spending their life behind a plow, they need much less territory at a time when American population is increasing on the move and needs that territory. This works for everybody. Okay? Now, there's certain flaws in this, of course, because Indian people throughout the <coughs> eastern part of the United States have been farming for hundreds of years. Okay? The problem for Washington Knox is, and the Americans is that the wrong people are doing the farming. Okay? You can't have women doing the farming. Men have to do the farming. Many of the delegations, like Corn Planter of the Seneca, who come to meet Washington in Philadelphia to talk diplomacy and how to deal with this Western Indian resistance, are also talking about taking this new path toward, if you like, civilization, converting Indian people, transforming tribal homelands into private property, not only for Americans, but for, for Indians, and changing Indian people forever. So for Washington and Knox, like many American policymakers right up to the end of the 19th century, this is a recipe for survival, maybe the only path to survival for Indian people. If Indians remain as they are, so they think, they are doomed to extinction. The only way for Indians to survive is to, frankly, stop being Indians. Okay? Give up their way of life, a tribal way of life, which is more than living in tribes, it's the values, it's the reciprocity, it's the, all of the uh, moral economy that that involves, which is antithetical to the, that which Washington is trying to impose. You need to give up that and become like Americans. And so Washington's the first president to issue peace medals, where you see Washington here holding hand out to an Indian the Indian is smoking a peace pipe. He's dropped his tomahawk. Washington still has his sword. But in the background, there's a figure with a plow. This is a future for Indian people. 
And these peace medals, just about every president of the 19th century gave these peace medals, um, were given to recognize Indian people who seemed to be going that way, like in this case, Red Jacket of the Seneca. That's a simplistic uh, depiction because Red Jacket of the Senator was a complicated individual who was actually quite a strong advocate of cultural resistance. But it's another dimension to this image of Washington. Um, an early review of my book in the New York Times Review of Books said, it seemed like I couldn't make my mind up. I was sort of deeply ambivalent about Washington. Yes, absolutely, that's the whole point. Right? Here is a president who, conscious of his, the moment in this nation's history, that we will be judged by what we do here for Native people. We will be judged by posterity, we'll be judged by other nations of the world, and we should be judged by ourselves. What kind of nation are we? What kind of society are we? We have to try and deal justly and honorably with Indian people. And meanwhile, we will be taking their land because we have no choice. We're like a shark going forward. For someone like Washington, this is an answer. Right? Civilization, as he called it, getting Indian people to change their way of life will allow them an opportunity and a space in this new republic. <clears throat> and so his record, I suppose, is mixed. Right? On the one hand, he makes treaties like the Treaty of Canandaigua, which demonstrate or establish a nation-to-nation -nation relationship between the United States and the federal government, as indicated here, where you have the 13 states joining hands and joining hands with the two smaller figures next to a, what looks like a uh, house, right? The 13 big figures are the states. The two smaller figures are the Mohawks on the eastern door of the Confederacy, the Iroquois Confederacy, and the Senecas on the western door. That's how you conduct diplomacy, by going in at the doors, not through the walls. Um, that's something that the Iroquois hold the United States to, to this day. Uh, so on the one hand, Washington is doing things like that. On the other thing, he's dispatching armies into Indian country saying, extirpate these people. Don't allow them uh, to make peace until you've done the work of destruction. So in Indian country, I think, in Indian communities, his record was mixed and his attitudes towards him were somewhat ambivalent. Even in his own, own lifetime and then as soon as he dies, because once he dies, he assumes this um, status almost of a demigod. And many Indian people invoke his memory, either through actual reverence or through political savviness. Right? Well, Washington was trying to deal with this decently, so you should. Right? So this is John Ross, principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, at the time of the Trail of Tears. When in 1830, the United States has answered that question that Washington Knox asked, what will be the place of Indian people in our nation? In 1830, Congress and Andrew Jackson answered that question. There will be no place. <clears throat> the Indian Removal Act authorized the president to sign treaties with the Indian nations east of the Mississippi and remove them west of the Mississippi, a policy of ethnic cleansing. John Ross, principal chief of the Cherokees, had tried to prevent that through a policy of adaptation and adjustment, and did so to the extent that even the United States recognized the Cherokees, Choctaws, Cherokees, Chickasaws, uh, <clears throat> Seminoles, and Creeks as the five civilized tribes. They were still kicked out. From Perspective of someone like George Ro John Ross in the 1820s and 1830s, confronting that, looking back to the age and the presidency of George Washington, must have seemed a little bit like a golden age, relatively speaking. Andrew Jackson, George Washington. <clears throat> John Ross named one of his sons George Washington. Thank you. <laughs>
And I've left some time for questions, not as much as I was advised, uh, but I'm told if you have a question, if you could come to a microphone to ask it. Um, I always have to start out by saying I'm not from the United States, I'm from the Caribbean. And as you well know, we face the same thing in the Caribbean with, um, with the different colonial powers, the, the, mm -hmm. you know, the British, French, Dutch, etc., murdering out the local populations, the Arawaks, the Caribs, etc., etc. Um, you know, what really um, fascinates me with this talk is the fact that... Um, I would like to know when the white American settlers were undertaking these policies, um, how aware they were about what had happened. I'm sure they had to be quite aware in different parts of the world. And already the consequences, the blowback from those consequences. I mean, um, you know, the, I'm trying to remember the guy, the, um, the Spanish. Um, priests who, who decried it in the Caribbean. The Las Casas. The, yeah. the Las Casas, right? I mean, this was quite well known. And others, others were, were, were mm -hmm. ob obviously decrying it. Um, and, you know, um, Watt Churchill speaks about the mass slaughter. I mean, he, he has it up to tens and tens of millions of people. You know, that, that number is very controversial, but that it's a huge, huge number. So uh, you, you talk about how Washington was very aware that this can be a real horrific stain on the republic, right? Slavery is also a huge stain on the republic. Sure. You know. um, so how do you um, feel that these policies um, have become embedded in U U.S. foreign policy, U.S. policies, uh, you know, towards the native as present and towards other people uh, who, who come to the United States? So do you see that as a... Uh, as, as a foundational uh, aspect of, of these undertakings, and also the, obviously the resistance internally, mm -hmm. by, even by white Americans against those things. How do you see that playing out? And do you see it moving in a more positive or more productive direction? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so huge question, really important question. First of all, <clears throat> when Knox, Knox more than Washington, when Knox is walking, riding to Washington, one of the things that he cites on a couple of occasions is exactly what you're talking about. What, and with reference to Spain, right? he says, we look at what Spain did in its conquest and in its colonialism, and that's a path we must not go. You know, if we, we have an opportunity here to do something differently. If be a, uh, to establish a new path and not go that path of genocide and slaughter, etc. Right? <clears throat> so the aspiration is there. Right? And the, the, the understanding of what had gone on elsewhere in the world is there. Right? Where the halt comes or where the problem comes from these guys, from in terms of certainly Washington's thinking, is we can institute positive and beneficial policies. And, it, and supposing then we get Indian people to buy into them and agree with them. But then the bigger problem is how do we get white people to buy into them? And Washington actually, I would say, blames the wars on the frontier more often on white frontiersmen than he does on Indian people. Quite often he'll, he'll say you know, that if these people had the, the ability to display to the world in their own newspapers the atrocities, etc., that's done to them, right, we would, history would have a very different telling. Right? And so I think both of them, in thinking about this stuff, uh, recognize that they're not operating in a, in a sort of blank slate. They're, they're operating in a context, a colonial context. There's a legacy of this kind of and they are also in a world where these assaults on Indian country and in Indian communities are continuing and will continue no matter what they do. Right? 
so interesting left, the thing that Washington uh, complains long and hard about in 1763 was that the British <coughs> put uh, limits on Indian country. Traders can only go there with a license and no land sales or um, sessions of Indian land are legal <coughs> without the crown being there. In 1790, now he's president, Congress passes the Indian Trade and Intercourse Act, which has two main components. One, traders need to have a license to go into Indian country, and no land sales or sessions of Indian land are legal without congressional approval. Right? And that conjures up a whole bunch of land claims cases because most states in, in 1790 just ignore it. Right? <clears throat> but Washington says time again, in order to stop people encroaching onto Indian land and stop people going into Indian country and committing hostilities that cause these war, we would need a line of soldiers or a Chinese wall. So it's very much like the British government, aware of the limitations of, um, so the problems obviously with colonial power, but the limitations of colonial power in trying to restrict its own citizenry. Greg Dowd writes an, an interesting essay, um, probably directed at me, because right? we know each other well. And said, you know, so the assumption is that Indian people side with the Americans during the revolution because they thought they would have been better off. Right? Um, I think there's no question that Indians at the time of the revolution side with the British because they think that, that was the, they were the lesser of the two evils. But Greg asked that question, would they really have been better off? Let's look at how indigenous peoples around elsewhere in the world were treated and fared under the British Empire. It doesn't look that good. Right? Um, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's a fair enough uh, observation. Uh, but I think these, these, these patterns that you're talking about are so pervasive that they, um, <clears throat> Washington and Knox recognize them, and they also recognize how limited their uh, their ability to deal with them is. Now, to get to the larger question, all of this, of course, is about a sustained assault on Indian rights and resources, indigenous rights and resources. And it's been going on before this around the world, and it continues after this around the world, and it continues in this country to this day. Look at Standing Rock you know, and all of everything that, that, that's happened in the last year. Uh, and so in answer to your question, do I see things getting better? No, frankly. Professor, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>